you sound great. I think I will like having you here. The one with the fish, I hope you fed it before you left home. <laughs> As you know, 2020 is our word for perfect vision. And I would say that the class of 2020 makes to me a perfect sight as I look out at you. This is a great day for the university. This is the day of renewal, the day when you bring us the surge of new energy that will lift everything here to new heights. And truth to tell, on your side, this ceremony is also a very significant transition. As of today, you are a child no longer. As of today, high school is far behind you and let me just proclaim it, by the powers vested in me, I hereby proclaim you a student of Duke University. Or let me reach for a stronger word. What if I were to say, I now proclaim you a citizen of Duke University? Let's stop and think what difference that word would make. A citizen. A citizen is more than a resident. A citizen is a name for somebody who's a member, somebody who fully belongs. And what do you belong to if you're a citizen? We don't speak of people as being citizens of their family or citizens of a club. You're only a citizen when you're a member of some large social agglomeration big enough to contain lots of people you don't personally know. You probably know that the word citizen derives from the Latin word kiwitas, city, from which we also have other words like civic and civil. And in the day when the largest effective social unit was a city-state, you were a member of a city. You were a citizen. Nowadays, as you know, citizenship mostly applies to membership in a national community. And so we can say we have citizens of 70 nations sitting in, the, uh, in this ceremony for the class of 2020. Another thing you know, citizenship brings privileges like the right to vote, uh, the right to serve on juries, many others. And you also know that citizenship brings duties, though the duties vary from place to place. If you're from Singapore, if you're from Switzerland, you may already have performed compulsory national service before you come to college. And if you are a naturalized citizen of the United States, you pledge to uphold the Constitution of the United States. So far, so good, right? This all sounds pretty simple. But as this summer taught us, in practice, the concept of citizenship can be quite a contentious one. I was in England this summer by chance on the day of the Brexit vote. It was going to be a near thing, but those who favored remain, we would say stay, but in England you use more glorious words, those who were in the remain camp were quite confident until in the early hours of the morning of June 24th when the last vote was counted, it was revealed that the population of the United Kingdom had voted to leave the European Union without anybody having any idea what actually that would mean. So you also know this, the European Union is a relatively amazing creation of the late 20th century in which a score of countries on a continent where strife among sovereign nations had embroiled the whole world in world war, not once but twice in the early 20th century. All those countries came together uh, uh, with, uh, to form the idea of a union they could join, a supranational entity in which they'd give up some of their separate rights to win the benefits of a larger union. You maybe also know, under the Treaty of Maastricht, every citizen of an EU country also became a, 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 a one citizenship in the European Union giving them uh, the, uh, uh, the right to free flow of peoples and economic activity across national borders. This union has brought peace and significant prosperity to a war-ravaged continent, and it was always a creation of hope. But as you probably also know, that hope was also shrouded by doubts and fears. And this June 24th, the majority of British voters decided that their fears of lost sovereignty and the influx of foreigners outweighed the benefits they could see in an open community. We know a little something closer to home about hopes and fears attached to the idea of citizenship. The United States is a country whose culture and economy are visibly made dynamic by the continual inflowing and intermingling of all the peoples of the world you know that this country is going through one of its not infrequent bouts of nativism, 
a time when people speak about erecting barriers against people who might aspire to citizenship, and where it seems that citizenship is defined by who we would exclude rather than the values we aspire to share. But I'm not going to talk about that now. If you want to learn about an interesting subject, go learn something about the history of citizenship and the conflicts attached to it. But if I have that word on my mind today, it's because of you. Here you are today joining Duke Nation. So what does it mean to be a citizen of Duke? Citizenship always entails some definition, some mechanism for deciding who's in, who's out, and by what process could people be brought inside. In most countries, I think in all countries, if one or more of your parents was a citizen of the country at the time of your birth, you have citizenship in that country as well by what in law is called jus sanguinis, the right of blood. In a way smaller number of countries, they're almost all located in the Western Hemisphere, and the United States is prominent among them, you can also get citizenship by being physically born in a country, whether your parents are, citizenship, uh, are citizens or not. This is called use solely, right of the soil. So what determines citizenship at Duke? There's only one way. You may have been born in Duke Hospital, but that did not win you admission here. You may have a parent who went here, and if so, when that happens, we rejoice in the continuity of the family. But nobody had a hereditary right to come to Duke. No one is admitted to Duke who has not passed through a searching assessment that starts with tests and grades and things of that sort, but goes much further, asking how you took advantage of the opportunities you had available to you, and asking whether your actual academic work actually shows signs of curiosity and intellectual engagement, rather than the much less impressive ability to look like you care and do well. Plus, we consider the sum of all the things you were involved with so that we can ask ourselves whether you're characterized by the will to live up to the full measure of your talent with the work that entails, and if you have an inclination to use your gift on behalf of others. I pause. You are here today because each in your own way and in your own circumstance, you demonstrated that you have the degree of promise that Duke seeks. If you are proud and think you alone deserve to be here and are wondering what the rest of these clowns are doing here, you are wrong. Each person here passed the same searching test that you passed. And if you are anxious, a much more common response, and think that everybody here does deserve to be here but you, you're wrong about that as well. You proved yourself just as fully as any other member of your class. You're entitled to uh, citizenship at Duke because you, own, you earned it the only way it can be won, namely by being a person of promise, eager to live up to your full potential. So far, so good. Cool. So are there any privileges to being a citizen of Duke? There are many. This is an easy question. Duke offers opportunities for every possible form of discovery and self-discovery known to man in arenas academic, artistic, athletic, entrepreneurial, social, spiritual, local, global, you name it. You have never heard of a university where more opportunities are on offer to undergraduate students. And your admission here is your ticket to explore and enjoy every opportunity a great university has created. And the duties? This is where many modern ideas of citizenship fall a little flat. As I noted, some of you may come from countries that have mandatory national service, but the United States doesn't. In my adult lifetime, this country has more or less stopped asking its citizens to make sacrifices on behalf of the general good. Do you know that if you lived in Australia, voting is compulsory? It isn't compulsory in this country, with the result that a large proportion of the population doesn't vote, which is to say the most primal right of democracy, the right to choose your government, in, uh, in some measure languishes from lack of use. You can decide for yourself how good it is for the world to have citizens turn into a passive enjoyment of goodies, but I am up here to tell you passive citizenship has no place at Duke. For this place to work, you have a responsibility to participate. And if you wonder what I mean, I will spell it out in mind-blowing detail. First, 
Why go to a university whose programs are being copied all around the world unless you actually try to find out something about those programs, see which ones uh, would serve you, and then try to figure out how you could participate in them? Go do it. But then second, at Duke, it's not a matter about signing up for classes and enrolling in programs. Duke exists to transmit the whole store of human understanding, but we're really here, our real work is to continually increase that store. So at a university, you take truths that seem final, but then you question them, you challenge them, you interrogate them with teachers and students working as partners to, uh, 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 toward an ever fuller understanding. But this only works if you participate, if you pitch in, if you join the discussion, if you ask the question that's itching in your mind, if you share the portion of the truth that you alone were gifted to see. Then third, at a place as rich in talent uh, and perspective as this one, every acquaintance and every social interaction could enlarge the understanding you've achieved to date. We've just rebuilt the main common spaces of this university, Marketplace on East Campus, West Union on West Campus. We've uh, made that investment because we understand that at a great residential university, informal personal exchange, the unstructured interaction of teachers and students and students with their fellows is a primary means of learning. But to get this benefit, you actually have to have the courage to enter into conversation with people who will be strangers at first. You have to have that courage, the courage to start conversations, not just superficial conversations, but in those conversations, you have to have the courage to run the risk of the deeper sharing through which deeper understandings are eventually for. Fourth, Students have told me, some upper class students, that they went through rough patches in their first couple of days or weeks at Duke. How could that possibly be surprising? There is no real world in which perpetual stress-free bliss is guaranteed, not convincingly guaranteed, uh, and even if there were such a place, no student would want to go there because people only grow when they seek out and face up to challenges. At the same time, these same students have told me that hard days became easier for them as soon as they found somebody who could be a mentor, an upperclassman, a faculty member, a staff member, all kinds of people are possible. There's no university where more people are willing to play this role for you, but to find your natural advisors, you have to reach out, you have to do part of the work of making the connection. Take seriously your responsibility to be active in your education, and this place will give you the full measure of what you came here to get. But there's one more duty citizens of Duke have, which is you have to help create the environment in which every other person can have the same rich experience as yourself. Any way you could find to victimize someone, to humiliate someone, to silence someone, to exclude someone, that takes away that person's rights, and it also robs you of the contribution they could make to your knowledge. Every way you find to respect people, to listen to people, and to encourage their full participation, every way you do, do that builds their power and equips them to teach you. Please listen up. This is not an obligation some of you have to some others of you. This is a care each of you owes to all of you. I'm almost done. My friend, Christoph Gutentag, lifted your spirits with humor and pleasantry. That opened the space for me to load you down with weighty expectation. <laughs> My excuse is, it actually makes a difference if you visualize and embrace the kind of commitments I'm laying out before you today. If you lower your expectations for Duke upon arrival, you can guarantee you will get a lower quality experience by the time you finish here. Thinking about citizenship, I looked at a government website where I found an interesting phrase. It said, citizenship is a unique bond that unites people around civic ideals. I ask you to bond around the aspirations that Duke is built on. The idea of individual personal development, the idea of education through community, and the idea of active, ongoing pursuit of truth. So let's get this right. This could be fun. Have you ever seen a citizenship ceremony? Neither have I, so let's make one up. Let me ask you to please raise your, raise your right hand. Do it, get them up there. Now, 
Do you solemnly swear to pay allegiance to the values of your university in the life you live every day you are here? If so, please signify by saying aye. Aye. If so, please signify by saying aye much more com uh, compellingly than you just did. Aye. Congratulations, you are now a citizen of Duke. <laughs>